it's impossible to live somebody else's life and nobody f fundamentally understands you the way you do so you have to uh, you have to explore that and it's not going to be perfect you're going to make a lot of mistakes and do a lot of stupid things and uh, you'd see that as a as a progression and something that you can you can build upon and uh, yeah just keep being curious and and uh, moving forward <laughs>
yeah, I think the the interest grows from there too, maybe. Yeah. Yep, totally. And so it's I always find it fascinating because I actually had another Swedish NHL player on the podcast a few episodes ago, Michael Backlund. Um, and so yeah. I was talking to him, and I always found it fascinating because he was talking about some of his mentors and role models growing up were the American NHL players. So there wasn't many yeah. two guys in Sweden that you looked up to at an early age. It was more of the NHL stars. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, he's uh, probably 10 years younger younger than me. So, uh, I mean, we had plenty of of Swedish NHL players you can look up right. to. So I don't think that that was ever a problem. Uh, but uh, uh, I know, I think maybe for the, the, the younger, the generation that was maybe 10 years older than me, I think maybe at that point uh, also, like, I don't know, like Olympics or national team or something like that, maybe it would have been more... Uh, interesting. I don't know if it's different for different people. I, I, I think most of the kids growing up now probably have, you know, the Stanley Cup in mind. Uh, I would, I would assume that they do in Sweden as well. But uh, so it's like from generation to generation, I think it, it shifted over more and more. Uh, whereas now there's so many players also Swedish in the NHL. It must be a new record that this year I would assume. So. Um, it becomes more and more, of course, and then you know, in the seventies or eighties, wasn't wasn't that many? So maybe that's what that wasn't the thing you were thinking about, you know. And and things are now more global now, and uh, seen all the time. I mean, you can follow NHL now basically twenty four hours if you want to, with games and updates and social media and all these things. So you you uh, uh, you can't get away from the game even if you want to now. So that's completely different from before, of course. But yeah, yeah, the power of social media is incredible, and I think it's a good thing for the yeah. game. It's growing the game. Uh, but you mentioned um, your NHL career, and so you did have the honor to play on the national team, but I want to stick with the NHL theme right now. So I think it was the 2006 and seven season that you made your NHL debut um, with the New Jersey Devils, right? Did you have a kind of welcome to the NHL moment? Uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I felt very fortunate at that time. We were right on the salary cap, and a lot of things were changing around in the NHL. We went from from big players to small players and players that could could skate and move. I remember that shift quite uh, quite well. And I think that opened up an opportunity for me. I think I, if I would have been two or three years earlier, uh, that would not have been the case. I would have been too small. I remember in my draft year, trying to make myself as big and uh, heavy as possible and uh, to not be overlooked at, you know, whatever... Five eleven and a half. I was trying to stretch myself as much as possible, and uh, you know, at that time, like if you're a defender and, and you were under two hundred pounds, it was almost like no, no, there's no chance you can play in the NHL, right? So I think I hit that switch perfectly, where there was a need for more mobile defenders uh, that could skate and move, and uh, of course, also getting the opportunity from uh, from uh, uh, Lou was. Uh, uh, was uh, yeah, was uh, you know, it was a big big thing, of course. So uh, I don't know exactly what that moment was, but uh, I always had a sense that uh, I I could play in the NHL or I belonged there for some reason, and uh, it felt very natural actually coming in and doing that. But uh, of course, you know, in the first game, I think I played Carolina my first game, uh, and. Uh, yeah, some somebody acknowledged that before the game, like and just enjoy the game, whatever it is. And you go out on the ice on the warm up, and you actually realize that, oh, okay, you're, this is like kind of it now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that's um, that's a nice, uh, nice first experience to have, yeah. and uh, realize realize that the thing is that you've been looking at uh, actually comes to comes to life. Yeah. You got to pinch yourself on that pregame skate. But I think it, like you mentioned, um, it wasn't really an easy road. You weren't this first round draft pick. It wasn't a sure thing that you were going to find an NHL roster spot. So for you in that kind of in-between period in the fringe was when are you going to get the call up and all that, was there a lot of self-doubt? Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, coming from, uh, I think there might be, you know, if you're a first rounder, it might be opportunity for you to have more self-doubt possibly. Right. I don't know. But if you're, if you're coming from like underneath, so to speak, there's uh, the, nobody believes that you can do anything. So uh, either you believe it or nobody's going to believe it. And if you do something, then people are actually surprised. And that's usually quite positive. So um, 
and then they see that you're working hard and they want to give you opportunities and i think there's a lot of upside from that as well you know there's uh, I can I can see myself as fortunate sometimes with that compared to some of the other players that maybe you know are first round pick and uh, you're supposed to live up with all these standards and people are expecting things of you and maybe you're not mature enough to actually deal with that at the moment. So there, there's many. Um, I've seen a lot of players go the other way in this league uh, and uh, not have the ability to deal with that pressure in that way. So. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure what's what's better or worse. Uh, of course, it looks better if you go in the first round, and uh, you might be paid a little bit more up front. But uh, but other than that, uh, I think every every way that anybody has uh, has to be, uh, you know, it will be their way, and it will be the way that's uh, uh, you know uh, laid in front of them, uh, so to speak, without being too uh, poetic. But uh, uh, I, I always felt that was good for me, taking everything in steps. I could develop in the, the way I needed. And uh, that's also why I preach now to younger players that find uh, you don't have to be ready. You don't have to be ready, ready right away. Uh, but you need to understand what you need to do and then progress into that. And then don't be frustrated. Maybe if things don't uh, work out as uh, as you want, for, uh, like right from the get-go. But... Uh, is it possible to uh, to uh, develop slowly nowadays? And and I don't know. I think the game has changed a lot there. Like the league is a lot younger, and you need to be prepared earlier than before. You were given more time. Uh, but uh, yeah, everybody has their way, and then and is the possibility to find that. So yeah, it can be a blessing in disguise almost to be kind of a lower round draft pick, and like you said, not have that much pressure as a first round guy. As a lower round draft pick, you could play with a chip on your shoulder and, and really prove yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think there's uh, there's enormous value to that. There's enormous value to, you know, battling. It's almost like this thing where you're, you're the first you're the first seed in the playoffs going in, or you're the eighth seed. Like there's a reason why every year there's one or two upsets in the in the first round. It's because you battle all the way in and you're prepared when you get there. You know, and I think this is similar too. Like if you never hit obstacle and you're always the superstar, and then all of a sudden you come into a team where there's 15 other superstars, like, what are you going to do? And uh, that's uh, that's a lesson that some kind of overcome, and they understand how to deal with it, and then can progress, and then some just wither away, and they, they can't do it for some reason. So, uh, um, yeah, I think that the concept is uh, it's interesting, and there's value you know, on both sides, of course. Yeah, you can play with nothing to lose. And so yeah. fast forwarding a little bit in your career, you get traded to the Chicago Blackhawks and in 2013, you win your first Stanley cup. And that's gotta be probably just the greatest moment of your sports career to this time, right? Like what was that feeling hoisting the cup, uh, walk skating around the ice on home or away ice, sorry, in Boston. What was that moment like for you? Yeah, I think the whole, I mean the whole, that whole season was, uh, was quite spectacular. I mean, I think we won, well, we didn't lose the first 23 or 24 games or something wow. like that. I think that that team was, I remember sitting on the bench and just watching, you know, <laughs> watching uh, Duncan and Siebes and whoever was on the ice, like Taser or uh, Holes. And, the, the, you know, they were just playing around with the puck and nobody could touch the puck for like 15 minutes. And I was like, "This is not normal." <laughs> like, yeah. it was like, I had the best seat, uh, best seat possible to watch, uh, uh, watch some of these guys, and of course, be a part of that too. But uh, um, we had a really good team, and uh, and even with that, it wasn't set up. Nothing, you know, is set uh, set in stone when it comes, especially what we talked about with the playoffs. You know, so we had a, we had a game seven uh, at home. Uh, against um, against Detroit there, I think. And, uh, yeah, basically, it couldn't have gone either way. I think we were down 3-1 also in that series yeah. and actually came back. And, and uh, there's always, like, in every playoff, I feel this one, one or two games that are like that, which shifts everything. And uh, it could have gone the other way, and uh, now it didn't. And uh, that got our, uh, you know, not the hopes up, but we you always have that pressure on you to to deliver that right because you, know, you know like wow this is a really good chance and will we uh, what if we miss it now you know so um i think the experience of the guys before that they won in 2010 i think that helped a lot and uh 
then just uh, you know we played hard. The playoffs was was fun, and uh, I think also the ending there was so fast. Like we we were waiting for almost like overtime of another game. Where first we were losing, and then everything shifts. So I think it was just chaos for for a certain amount of time before we realized what was going on, and then um, you know the parties the parties on yeah. right. So um, I I always. Uh, I always appreciate what the, what the NHL is doing which, when you actually get the cup afterwards as well, because that the, the first week there was just, I remember one or two days in, I'm like, oh, so the parade is on Friday and today it's like Wednesday and now it's been a party for two days. I'm like, how's this like, how's this going <laughs> to, this is not going to land well, you know? Right. And um, and everything is just one big commotion, and then you get the cup, and then you can have it uh, at home a couple of months later. And that that's really when everything lands, I think, for everybody that you can share it with your family and friends and bring it to people. And and uh, I I really think that's a cool thing. I wish more leagues actually did that, uh, and not just the NHL. But I think it's cool that um, uh, that the league is doing that, and uh, it, it really binds together any everything and gets you. Um, yeah, you, you can reflect more and uh, and uh, have some time to do that in between. It's a really cool thing. I always love seeing the videos of the players with the cup and whatnot. And I think I think the Stanley Cup is the greatest trophy in sports, and it's it's not even close. Um, but going back to that game six uh, against the Bruins the, in 2013, the night you guys won, um, you guys were losing two one in the final two minutes of the third period, I believe. And then there was a quick goal with like uh, under two minutes, and then you hit the slap shot from that blue line, right? And I forget who tapped it in, but that was the game winner. And so that talk about coming back and being down in the series, like, and everything happening so fast, like, do you even remember that final two minutes? And, like, what was that? It must have been hectic, right? Because in the Bruins' minds, they're like, all right, we're pushing to game seven. All the Bees fans think we're going to game seven. And just like that, um, you guys are holding up Lord Stanley on, on their home ice. Yeah, it was really fast, exactly like you're explaining. It, it moved from one thing to another. Uh, I think Big C scored first. There was a couple of nice plays there. And then, um, yeah, we basically got lucky. I mean, we were just, we just wanted to attack. I mean, we, we put, basically put the fourth line on the ice and me and Hammer to make sure that nobody scored more than trying to score maybe. And uh, we just got into a zone. I put a shot off and... Uh, uh, I think Fro Frolik tipped it and then Boland uh, put it in. And uh, I remember looking at the clock and I don't know how much was left. It wasn't that much left, like a minute or yeah, something, like maybe less than seconds, that. I think. Yeah, it was something like that. And um, yeah, we, yeah, we were just thinking at the time that okay, let's uh, we're not celebrating yet. So let's uh, let's see here what's uh, what's going on. So we got a couple of more thing, a couple of more minutes to defend, but. Uh, yeah, I think that the whole thing was just strange, yep. to be honest with you. And it felt like it was, uh, in some ways, maybe uh, it was supposed to be like that. Uh, and um, yeah, just really strange. Everything happened really fast, yep. uh, but a lot of fun, of course. And then, you know, any any way you can take a win at that. I mean, the Bruins were magnificent. That Like the whole series was, yeah, extremely, extremely tough to play. So... Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I, we, we were happy any way we can get it. I think you're, you're, you're happy 100%. at that point. So. No, 100%. Yeah. And congrats to you guys on that. And then, like, again, you do it in 2015. You win your second Stanley Cup. And, like, that the Blackhawks, Chicago Blackhawks, just become one of the greatest dynasties in all of sports because you mentioned they won before you got there. And so you were talking about playing NHL, the video game, and whatnot growing up as a kid. And I think anyone who grew up in that age group um, where NHL was popular and the Blackhawks were the dynasty, using them in the NHL, the video game, was just a completely unfair disadvantage to anyone <laughs> playing. And it was the best thing ever. I always loved picking them, even as a Bruins fan. Yeah, that's, uh, that's funny because I think as soon as you – uh, you know, when you're a kid, you create your like your own uh, your own player, right? And you give him all the best stats all the time. And then uh, once I actually got a player uh, from the from the video games, I start stopped playing them for for some reason. I don't know. Uh, maybe it was because my stats were so bad, so I didn't <laughs> want to see how bad my, my my guy was. So I wanted to you know create my own and have 99 on everything, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a good team. We had a really, really good team. I mean, in 15, we had, uh, I think the team was good also, but then at that point, I think we leaned on a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I think that's a, that's a big difference, especially when you come to the finals. And uh, we would just we could sense that I, I felt extremely calm and very present the whole time, and, and that was something that I set out also because of the commotion that I wanted to enjoy uh, enjoy the playoffs as much as possible and enjoy that whole journey. Uh, and uh, have a different perspective, you know, from the first time. I, I remember some of the other guys talking about that as well in, in 15, that that been there in 2010, that you view it differently. Like they're all, it's like your kids, uh, right? That, that uh, you love them for different reasons and, and for different different times, so to speak. And uh, it's the same thing here. Like uh, the first one is also always the commotion and then you start to realize and understand actually what's going on, and then you appreciate that a lot also. So uh, it would have been, I would have been, uh, it would have been lovely to get a third one and uh, and also experience that. But uh, I think uh, uh, I'm I'm quite fortunate enough to be a part of two. So yeah. Yeah, I think you'll take two. And I guess like like you said, it's hard to kind of embrace the moment when you're in the heat of it and things are happening so fast. So I think it's really cool that you got that opportunity in 2015. But so in 2018, I believe you retired from the NHL and kind of wrapping up your NHL career here, I guess if you look back on your NHL career, what are you most proud about as a player? Oof, that's a good question. No, but I, I think I was always, uh, uh, and the same thing now, I think, I, I think I'm a quite, quite adaptable and curious individual. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to be useful for my team and to be useful for my teammates and, and Although, uh, you know, selfishly, I want to perform and be good. Uh, I feel like I, I'm at my best when I'm actually useful also for, for somebody else. And uh, uh, that I can have coaches trust me. I can have uh, teammates trust me. And, uh, you know, I think I, I wasn't especially good at anything, but maybe not terrible at anything either. So... I was kind of like hoovering around in the middle and nobody knew I was there, which is a role that I actually liked. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah, I would, I would say that that's w what I'm most proud of. And I, was, I, I stuck with, uh, uh, with it for, uh, for quite a long time. And, uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm, I'm mostly proud of. Yeah, that's awesome. You banked a lot of different games, and I think um, that is because you were adaptable, right? You were able to fit into different roles, into different locker rooms and different positions on the ice. So, um, again, kudos to you and your hockey career. But moving on here, you're more than a hockey player, right? You want to inspire greatness beyond the ice, right, to the next generation. So I want to turn to your new venture here at Tunia. Um, and I'll let you speak to what it's all about and your inspiration for finding the company. But just quickly, it's, it's an athletic apparel company with high-quality, sustainable technologies, right, to really help athletes achieve their peak performance. Um, but this is a new venture for you. So what was your inspiration for starting Atunia? Yeah, there's there's a couple of compo components, I think, to that. And, and number one is, um, uh, you know, of course, um, uh, the the performance factor and, you know, coming from the sport. And, and I always looked at whatever we were wearing at the rink. And I thought uh, there's some there's some holes in uh, <laughs> in uh in quality uh there's uh there's some holes in sustainability i don't understand why why you can't work and be in hard performance and then move into sustainability and when i talk about sustainability yes materials are one thing but also um uh, you know maybe production and the way that we create things and uh, also actually have them last for a long time. So so why not have quality in the things that you actually wear and you wear them all the time. And you see this in, in many, many other sports and many, especially in the outdoor community where high quality products uh, are, you know, it's, it's, it's a given almost. And uh, there's some enormous brands that are doing that. And when it comes to, um, when it comes to team sports that maybe that is not, uh, the main focus or haven't been and uh, I don't I never understood why you can't be you know performance and and thinking about those things at the same time I think in the future you see all the bigger brands now are moving in that direction uh, if I would have talked about this five years ago when I started to do this there there was nothing right and uh, now it's becoming 
uh, a given, something that you do. It's like free Wi-Fi at the hotel, right? You, you don't think about that anymore. But a couple of years ago, people were like, oh, what's the Wi-Fi code? Right. We need to figure out the Wi-Fi code, you know? Uh, so it's a hygiene factor, and it should be a hygiene factor, um, you know, when you, we do produce a lot of things in the world. So why not do it in a smart way? And uh, um, so that's one thing. And then, of course, also hockey as... Um, as a sport, is is very interesting to look at. I think the community and the people that play the game are, uh, are quite uh, traditional, and in some ways that's positive. In some ways, uh, maybe a challenge. And uh, if you look at what the world looks like outside of hockey, uh, it moves quite fast and it changes. Whereas in the sport, it's not that. Uh, it's not that we're not moving, but uh, to get influences, and we're not just talking about you know diversity in uh, you know so social economics or or um, or um, uh, you know ethnic whatever standards or whatever you would call it. Also, influence of, of creativity and and do things the new way and changing things. And uh, uh, I think we see that when it comes to tactics and in, in hockey and in the NHL. You know, somebody runs a new power play and scores a couple of goals have a good team, and then all of a sudden everybody's going to do the same thing, right? So so um, uh, I think new influences and way of looking at things and be creative, I think, I think uh, there's, there's possibility for the, grow, for the game to grow and also to attract other individuals that are maybe not typically looking at hockey at the moment. And this is one of the main things that I think will be interesting for the future. Uh, I've talked about this before, and especially in Sweden, we're, uh, we're seeing a... Um, uh, we've seen a development where, um, you know, society is, is expanding in some ways and uh, we're not really attracting different cultures coming into the sport. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a huge mistake and something that we really should look at. I mean, soccer now, I think in Canada, have the same challenge where soccer is taking up a lot of these new uh, young kids that, uh, uh, that want to get into sports and hockey is just too complicated for that and maybe uh, they have a tough time identify uh, with uh, with whatever's going on in the game right and of course we can talk about this cost money and it's more exp expensive but if we if we're going to hide behind that then i also think that would be a barrier right so let's talk about actually what we can do instead of trying to talk about you know all these uh, all these uh, money barriers that's uh, that's the challenge and uh, one really good example when it comes to hockey and and the the culture and how it is. It's when I started with Atunia too. Is that there's no hockey brands that live outside of the sport, yep. and I think that's that's very interesting because all other major sports actually transcend into other parts of society, and hockey doesn't do that. And also, you have the opposite flip where Nike bought uh, Bauer in the 90s, and when it tr transcend and come into the sport, and they actually sold them back, and now they're not in the game anymore. Uh, there might be a bunch of reasons to that, maybe the quality of the products and all these things, right? But Nike is the biggest brand in the world, and they couldn't do that. And why is that? Uh, and I think this is really interesting to look at. So how do we, how do we bridge the gap, and how do we, if we want to spread this game to Asia or Africa or, you know, South America or whatever it is, which I think would could be, uh, could be a cool thing to do, uh, then, then. What does it look like, and how do you do that? Uh, you can just watch now what uh, um, what um, the Formula One was doing uh, with this Netflix yeah. series, for example. I have I don't know how many people that have talked to me now, like, oh, it's Sunday, I'm going to watch the race. I'm like, what? You don't even like cars, right? And they did something, they expanded something, they were thinking in a new way, and all of a sudden they got millions of new fans, right, all over the world that never watched a car before in their life. And how do we apply this mindset into the sport of hockey? I think that's, uh, that's an interesting topic to, uh, to discuss. So for me, that is what Atunia is all about. Like, how do, we, how do we expand this? And how do we get new influences? And how do we develop? And w can we look a different way? Can we, can we talk a different way? Can we do certain things and still keep the, the culture and the core? I mean, we're not going to throw everything out. Like, hockey is a wonderful community. Like, anywhere you go in the world, you meet hockey players. I've been to a lot of different places. Uh, you know, Africa and Kenya. I've been in Thailand. 
all of these places you go to, the hockey community is wonderful. Yes. Like people are bound together through the sport uh, in the weirdest places you can imagine, where it's just pure love for hockey. So there's, there's an enormous power in that. Uh, but in that also, uh, is there a way to develop that? And that, like, how do we play around with that? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's the short answer of, uh, <laughs> of your question with the tune. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and I, I'm not, I didn't grow up playing hockey. I've, I've been a hockey fan my whole life. But really working with Torch Pro, I've really been introduced to the hockey community through our core of Joe Pavelski, obviously, who's our co-founder. But I really felt that, right? Like, they are very welcoming. And every NHL athlete we've ever worked with, has been amazing. And so you feel that yeah. culture, and I think it is trying to spread that into other regions of the world is super important. And your other point of, like, spreading your brand of Atunia beyond hockey is a unique approach, I think, as well, because you mentioned the Bauer example. And I have an Atunia package um, coming my way in the mail right now, and I'm fired up about it, uh, but I'm not a hockey player. So I think that's kind of that crossover that you're looking for, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Exactly. And then another component is kind of there's an ode to your, your background as being Kenyan and bring hockey culture there. I think I was going around on your website. There's only one hockey rink, I think, in the entire country, right? And um, yes. I think there's a half a rink, actually. Half a rink? <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a full-size rink, no. Yeah, and so I think yeah. spreading the culture of hockey there is a big like brand pillar of you guys, correct? Uh, yes, and it was it's actually cool because they um, they already have a hockey program and they they've been doing some things before. Uh, they have a, a couple of commercials that they filmed. I think they did one with Tim Hortons uh, a couple of years back, and uh, it's cool because they use this uh, they use this community to bring people uh, maybe out of some troubled areas and into the sport. And uh, with the with the money they get from doing some of these commercials and shoots and things they're doing. They um, they now obviously pay for school. Uh, we have also a funding program with that as well. So we're, we're trying to, um, you know, we're plugging into what they're already been doing for a while, which is amazing. Because uh, otherwise, you know, going there and try to start new things could be quite the challenge. So uh, we, um, uh, with all the things that we're doing, then uh, if, if somebody's interested in helping out doing certain things around that, then please... Uh, uh, you know, contact us uh, around that. Uh, there's always things to do. Uh, we want to do some things locally there. We do some other things in, in Stockholm as well uh, with some of the communities. So there's, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of things to do. But yes, it's part of the brand and uh, uh, we're trying to, trying to find a different angle and a different approach. Like I said, that, that this looks like, um, uh, looks uh, a little different. Yeah, yeah. I saw you guys take a trip there on one of your videos on YouTube. I think it was, and uh, the roller hockey community looks like it's more along the way than it is the ice rink, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's the same. The, now during the pandemic, it was actually closed down. Uh, the ice rink was closed down. It's in the top of the hotel there uh, that they have. So uh, that was closed down. It's open up now. So now they're on the ice. I don't know once or twice a week, and then they skate there in the park every Sunday. Uh, cruising around a lot of kids and it's it's a lot of people and that's so they have hockey on one side and then they have like the speed skaters on the other side and uh yeah they're good athletes yep. they're they're fast they're uh, they're intense they um they go down and they block shots with no pads on and uh, they're uh yeah they live really have a passion and, and they love the sport and uh, there's nothing more humbling than uh, than going to watch that right. so uh, I would I would recommend anybody uh, that uh, you know if you if you used to play in hockey in a certain way, then you know find a different hockey community, whatever that is. You know this that tournament that I went to in Bangkok. Now it's also they actually just played it now, but you can sign up. It's a land of smiles, I think. Uh, it's a tournament. You can bring your friends. You sign up. You go to Bangkok. You play this tournament. It's it's just amazing, and you meet all these different teams from all over the world, right? So. Uh, there's, uh, if you love hockey, find a, find a different place to go and play it in. Uh, I've seen there's some rinks in like the Himalayas now, and like you can go to China and play some outdoor games. And it's really fun thing to do if, if you, uh, uh, if you enjoy hockey and you have a group of friends that you play with. Yep. Yeah. It's cool to see you embark on this journey. Um, so, so keep crushing it. But I think for a lot of athletes, especially pro athletes, when they leave their sport, retire, whatever it may be that transition of what the hell do I do next can be really challenging. Um, and I'm sure you struggle with that in the very beginning. 
Uh, but now where you are with Atunia, what have you really learned from the world of business that you didn't under, really, really understand when you were playing in your NHL career? Huh. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. First of all, I, I don't think I, uh, I struggled with that. I had a lot of things that I, one of the reasons actually I think I stopped playing because I, there were some things around that I wanted to do and get into and learn. And um, I mean, now three years in, so to speak, or around three years. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things, but you, yeah, you can work a lot. Like when you're an athlete, there's, there's a short amount of time that you're working and the rest of the time you try to do as little as possible. Uh, so you can be as good as you can with this little time that you have, like the two hours or whatever it is in a day, right? And the, now it's completely opposite. Like you can work uh, all day and all night if you want to. Nobody's going to stop you. And and uh, your body might stop you at some point, but you, your, your brain, can you can do a lot of things, right? And uh, I think that's an adjustment I had to make. I had to apply some some sense into that. You know, I'm not... I'm not 22 i'm 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 almost 42 so so uh, i was i had to find a new structure around how to do that and and what's um, what's normal and what can i do and uh how do i want to live my life in that way and um so i think that's uh, uh the work the work life balance for me try to figure that out i was always quite a, quite an extreme individual uh, i think i applied that in my training and my approach to the game and um, I think I do the same now. I, I basically try to figure out how can I, how can I be as good as possible and enjoying that at the same time. And uh, so that's I think that's the, the biggest lesson and the, the complexity of, of running businesses. I don't know. Like I've never been in an executive position where in hockey, so I would I would know I was just a player. Uh, but uh, there's there's complexity in working with people, of course, and, uh, you know, having all of these different things that you kind of need to figure out and uh, getting exposed to. Whereas uh, if you're just an athlete and you're focusing on the kind of the one thing and you've been doing that for a very long time, then um, uh, it's more about uh, delivering that than maybe learning a lot of new things all the time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to start over basically. I'm starting from scratch, and, and I didn't know anything, and I'm learning a lot of things every day, and that's that's a lot of fun. Right. And uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, there's there's a lot of things I can make a whole list. I think of of the things that I'm learning. It feels like every day it's like, oh wow, I didn't know that. And now I have to, right. what what does that mean? And I have to look that up and talk to somebody and have, you know, advisors that will tell me certain things. And uh, but I have a lot of good people around me, which is I think it's important. And uh, um, people that are are passionate about, uh, you know, the the, um, the startups and and the uh, companies that we have, uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, that's the most uh, important thing that people really want to do it. Yeah, I think I think athletes have a pretty large advantage when diving into the world of work and the real world per se is because they have that competitive advantage and they also know how to work in teams. So they have that going for them. They might not have the technical skills of that industry or what it takes to be a founder, but I think they can quickly adapt um, given their, what they've done in sports and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, I'm, it's just being, if I can be humble enough to understand that uh, I can be the stupidest person in the room, exactly. then, then that's, uh, that's good enough for me. Exactly. Yeah. And so, no, I'm fired up for my Atunia package, excited to rock that gear and, and check that out. Um, but we'll dive into some rapid fire. You can do one word, one phrase, uh, but we'll shoot right through. And uh, yes, here we go. So who was your favorite athlete growing up as a kid? Mm. Good question. I'd say uh, Ray Bork. Ray Bork. I thought that was yeah, going to yeah. be the answer. Um, yeah, so who's your favorite athlete to watch in current day sports? Doesn't have to be hockey. Uh, oof. Rapid, huh? Um, wow, well, I don't want that much. Uh, who do I like to watch? Uh, Hockey wise, I mean, it's hard to beat McDavid. Yeah, I mean, I don't watch that much basketball, but if I watch Steph Curry, he's he's quite funny to watch. Uh, yeah, just uh, his approach to the game, I think. Uh, who else is interesting? Um, well, I mean, I've been up close with some of these guys that I love to watch, but now they're not maybe on the peak anymore. 
Um, yeah, but Curry is nice. Maybe, um, yeah, of course, like watching McDavid or something like that. It sometimes he just, and the things he does is uh, uh, you wonder how it works. Uh, I think Cal McCarr is one of those players too that are uh, quite interesting to watch. The new style of NHL defenseman right. anyway. So, yeah. Right. Okay, and so now you've had a lot of great moments as an athlete yourself. You you talked about your debut as a rookie, your 2013 cup, your 2015 silver medal with Sweden in the Olympics. But you got to pick one. What is your favorite moment as an athlete? Uh, yeah, I would probably say that's the 2013. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it's close. I mean, that countdown also we had in game, um, I think that was game six also at home in 2015, like that. I remember that countdown, the last like 10 seconds or whatever it was, uh, as it was felt like it was 35 minutes long. Yeah. Uh, everything just slowed down. Uh, I remember that part also and, and uh, the very presence of, of that, uh, that time and place. So I, I would say I would say that as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of small moments. I mean, that build up to that, and especially when you. I remember in that it's almost like all the things are like lining up behind you uh, in that time. But uh, I would probably pick one of those two. Yeah, I think that's that's quite obvious. But yeah. Yeah, and sticking to your athlete days, what was your favorite pregame meal? Ooh, uh, that changed a little bit going back and forth. When I was uh, when I was in in New Jersey, I ate uh, rigatoni pasta, rigatoni vodka, vodka sauce pasta, and chicken and some broccoli. Uh, that wasn't great for my stomach. I realized after a couple of years, uh, I really loved that though. But uh, then uh, uh, I think that the last part of my career, I ate um, uh, you know chicken or rice, uh, sweet potatoes. Uh, maybe some salad and uh, some broccoli, maybe something like that. So nothing too uh, too fancy. Back in chicken. My, yeah. Back in my athlete days, I also did the rigatoni with vodka sauce. And quickly realized it's, yes. it's not good. For I'm stomach. I'm going to New York next week, and I'm actually going to go 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 back to Hoboken where I lived uh, to stay on Thursday. So maybe I'll go down and and have another one just uh, for old time's sake. Some of yeah. the best food in the world in that area, right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So a few more here. Uh, who's your favorite music artist right now? Oof. That's a good question. I, oof, I listen to a lot of different. I have a style that I listen to now that I really like. It's um, it's Afrobeat, uh, um, Afrobeat kind of house music ish. Mm. Uh, it's from South America or South Africa. It's called uh, Amapiano, uh, which is uh, uh, a style that I really like. And there's a lot of different ar artists in that one, of course. But I, I would say that's. Uh, probably what i listen to i do a lot of breath work and breathing exercises so i kind of i'm into like the the little bit of a, the, the drony and like spacey music as well but there's not that many artists or there is artists but it's kind of mishmash so uh, i would say um yeah i would say those two uh, i have also like some uh, some deep house if i'm going dancing but go. uh, yeah it's a combination of those i would say yeah yeah that's like two ends of the spectrum right there some breathing yeah and some yeah deep house i'll have to check out yeah. the uh the Afrobeat, so that sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two more. What is your biggest fear? Oof. Uh, no, I think I think an enormous. Uh, that, like my biggest fear is probably to um, uh, to leave this place and and have have done no impact. Uh, I think that's. Uh, uh, my ego is just screaming around that. What if you disappear and it didn't mean anything, right? Yeah, it's like what, what <laughs> I think that what that's it is like, for Johnny Oduya. Yeah, exactly. Like, what, what can you leave behind? How, who, who did you um, impact? Did you shift life, uh, the perspectives of of, of people? Um, you know, did they find it useful? The things that you were doing. I think all of these things are probably my biggest fear. Uh, I don't fear uh, death by itself. I think. I think I fear. Uh, uh, you know, not have done what was needed to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think you've, you've probably impacted a lot of people already, but I think you're well on your way to impacting a lot more, especially through Atunia. Yeah. Um, and so one word that best describes Johnny Oduya. That is even more difficult. Yeah. I think you have to ask somebody else about that, actually. 
uh, passionate, I don't, inspirational. No, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I I like to see myself as curious. I I, I think I, I yeah, trying to explore the the world and myself as much as possible. So I I would stick with curiosity then to to keep it light and not too serious. There you and, go. There you go. Yeah. Well, Johnny, I appreciate the time. We have one final question to wrap with everything else we talked up talked about today. A lot of lessons, um, but if you had that one lesson that you've learned throughout your journey through hockey in Sweden and with Atunia now, that one lesson that you could pass along to the next generation to help them accomplish their dreams, what would that, what would that one lesson be? Yeah, it, it, it has to be with curiosity to do and, and try to, you have to find your way. Yeah, I think that's... Um, it's impossible to live somebody else's life and nobody f fundamentally understands you the way you do. So you have to, uh, you have to explore that and it's not going to be perfect. You're going to make a lot of mistakes and do a lot of stupid things. And, uh, you'd see that as a, as a progression and something that you can, you can build upon and, uh, yeah, just keep being curious and, and, uh, moving forward. And, uh, yeah, you don't have to take, don't have to take life as serious, but uh, uh, if you do, then um, you know you can take pride in being serious as well. So yeah. And if you're gonna, f uh, you don't have to be perfect, but if you're gonna fail, fail fast and, and keep moving forward. I think that's a great message, um, Johnny. Thank you so much for the time today, um, and look forward to doing this again soon, maybe. All right. Yeah, would love to. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you enjoyed the content. There's plenty more Pass the Torch episodes along with other podcasts we got going on and video series we do. So subscribe and we'll see you later.